of, of water to drink, because you bear the name of Christ, will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung round your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. One of the pleasures of Scripture One of the pleasures of Scripture is the way it steps out of character from time to time, or at least the character we tend to thrust upon it. It can be sweet, comforting, inspiring, and funny. It can also be ironic, harsh, inexplicable, and vulgar. Then you run across something like our text today. If one were to start attaching warning labels to certain passages of scripture, this would be a good place to begin because this text is definitely dangerous. Let's review the story first. The setting is the Persian Empire at some point during the Jewish diaspora. The Persian king Ahasuerus, on the advice of his counselors, decides to replace his queen Vashti after she refused to come to him when summoned. He holds a long, drawn-out search for the perfect replacement and settles on Esther, a Jewish orphan raised by her pious uncle Mordecai. She becomes his new queen, but she keeps her Jewish heritage secret. Shortly thereafter, Mordecai discovers a plot to assassinate Ahasuerus and reveals it to the king, thus potentially saving his life. The problems begin when King Ahasuerus' new viceroy, Haman, takes notice that Mordecai, because of his Jewishness, refuses to, to bow and do obeisance when Haman walks by. This is an intolerable insult, and he begins to plot not only Mordecai's demise, which involves impaling him, not hanging him, on a stake 50 cubits high, or about 75 feet. In addition, for good measure, Haman wants to destroy all the Jewish people. Ahasuerus, who is hardly capable of an independent thought, gives his approval to Haman's genocidal scheme. A date is chosen, the 13th month of Adar, and a royal decree goes out to all the empire to see that it is done. Mordecai implores Esther to intercede with the king, but she fears doing so, because to appear unsummoned before the king is a capital offense. However, to make a long story short, Esther takes the risk, reveals her own Jewish heritage, and prevails upon the king to rescind the order. 
As for Haman, the king mistakenly believes that he has designs on the queen, so he orders Haman executed on the very pole that was set up for Mordecai. Due to the nature of Persian bureaucracy, the king cannot annul his own order to kill all the Jews, so he adds an amendment permitting the Jews to band together to destroy those seeking to kill them. On the appointed day, in an epic reversal of fortune, the Jews slaughter over 75,000 of their Persian would-be oppressors in various cities throughout the empire. Mordecai is elevated to the rank of prime minister, Esther remains the queen, and they all lived happily ever after. It may not surprise you to learn that getting the book of Esther into the canon was a tough sell. It was the last book to be added to the Hebrew Bible, and the Christians didn't exactly take to it readily either. That whole controversy itself is fascinating, perhaps for another time. Interestingly, of all the hundreds of biblical manuscripts found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are no copies of Esther. The book is also controversial because God is neither named nor even mentioned anywhere in the text. The story it tells of deliverance and vengeance is celebrated in the Jewish festival of Purim, which, among other things, involves getting royally inebriated. According to a passage in the Talmud, if you can tell the difference between the phrases cursed be Haman and blessed be Mordecai, you are insufficiently sloshed, or verschnickered, as they say in Yiddish. Now, I've been making light of what is in fact a rather volatile book. Esther speaks directly to the reality of those who face the threat of persecution and genocide. It is a tale that the Jews know only too well, as do many other peoples throughout history and around the world. Esther actually sanctions fighting back. No turning the other cheek here, no sir. It further captures in its clownish kings and shady courtiers the tangled bureaucracies typical of Mesopotamia and the surrounding areas. Royal courts so riven with legal mazes palace intrigues, outsized egos, and rank incompetence that they would actually sanction such a hideous act without even realizing it. Esther herself presents a bit of a problem. She is Jewish, but married to a Gentile king and is queen over a pagan empire. There's no indication that she is a practicing Jew. She does not pray, keep kosher, or display any inclination to restore her people to their lands. In fact, unlike Daniel, another Jewish courtier who lands in a Gentile court, she hides her Jewishness. Esther is fully vested in the Persian Empire and all its power. What do we do with a text like this? I discovered that early Christian interpreters didn't have much to say about this that was particularly helpful, so I consulted Jewish sources, which only makes sense, since it's their book after all. One of the weekly readings in most synagogues is the story of Esther, but on the previous week, the reading is a section called Parshat Zakor. It is the story of King Saul and the extermination of the Amalekites, an ancient and implacable enemy of Israel. Things do, do start to make sense when we learn that Haman was an Agagite, a people who had descended from the Amalekites. This reading concludes with a command to wipe out Amalek in every generation, which frankly seems to make matters more ethically unsettling. And yet, historically, genocide is not a theoretical problem with the Jews, and so a text that enjoins them to rise up against their oppressors is understandable. The problems start when this episode is abused as an excuse for violence, as it was on Purim in 1994, when a fanatical West Bank Jewish settler named Baruch Goldstein entered a prayer hall at the tomb of the patriarchs 
and opened fire with an automatic rifle on Palestinian worshippers, killing 29 and injuring 125. I should further point out that the original campaign by Saul against the Amalekites was an example of Herem, or what we might call holy war in the Old Testament. Under these rules, everything is destroyed and nothing, absolutely nothing, is taken as spoil. Esther notes repeatedly that when the Jews rose up and destroyed their oppressors, they took no plunder, implying that this was conducted as a holy war. The problem for us is context. These days, polite society tends to frown upon the idea of holy war, regardless of who's doing it. Oppression, however, persecution, poverty, slavery, wages, uh, wars of aggression, and so much more up to and including genocide, is still happening and too often ignored. Consider that genocide is happening today in Myanmar, China, Ethiopia, Iraq, Syria, and South Sudan. Consider also that the separation of immigrant families and caging of their children on our southern borders satisfied at least three possible definitions of genocide according to international law. How long, O oh Lord? Let me offer an answer through a rough comparison from the Christian tradition that might prove instructive. In early Christianity, believers were on the receiving end of violence. Martyrdom became the ultimate expression of faith and dedication, literally a consummation devoutly to be wished. But after Christianity became the official religion of Rome, one could no longer give one's life to God by violent death. Instead, many believers chose to give their lives to God via monastic vows and a life of piety and service, and so it continues to this day. In Esther and early Christianity, violence was applied or redirected to serve a higher purpose until that means became untenable. But that does not absolve us from confronting oppression. Only the methods have changed. I made reference earlier to turning the other cheek as though it were an act of submission, but I don't actually think that's what Jesus had in mind. When confronting oppression, turning the, the other cheek is not an act of submission. It is an act of defiance. Oppression exists. As Christians, we are charged to ease the burdens of those who groan under oppression, even if it does not rise to the level of genocide. It is one of the most basic elements of the Christian message. Christians historically extended their service and comfort beyond their community, easing the pain of poverty, injustice, disease, and prejudice. As those Jews in Esther's story rose up in fury to protect their own lives, our struggle to establish justice is likewise a fight for our own salvation. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able. We're at the bottom of page three. Let us affirm our faith together, saying words from the ancient church, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit 
and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have heard today of the cost of discipleship, that we may be empowered to bear the name of Christ. Let us pray for ourselves and for the whole world, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. The Church of God is fragmented. We need the whole healing of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray for the Church. The world cries out for an increase of justice and for an end to war. Let us pray for the world. Lord, hear our prayer. Our country is striving for equality and a better life for all its citizens. Let us pray for our nation. Our community seeks a better sense of its gifts and more wisdom into its problems. Let us pray for our local community. Lord, hear our prayer. We know many people who are sick and suffering, who have public hurt or private pain. Let us pray for all in need. Lord, Our lives have been enriched by the lives of all those like Esther, the prophets, and the disciples who have gone before us in faith. Let us pray for grace to be disciples. Lord, hear our prayer. And we lift to God the prayers of our own hearts. Prayers for Sarah. For Laura, for the souls of Betty and Bobby, we are thirsty. O merciful God, give us a cup of water to drink. Hear our prayers and answer our cries of need all through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us make our confession together. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Saviour, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Beloved, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. You're welcome to sit for a moment.
Well, welcome today. A uh, few things just to remind you of. First is that this evening we will be uh, starting our first um, live, live streamed Compline, evening Compline service. That will be at seven o'clock. It's uh, online, it's on Zoom. Links are in the Wednesday email, also on the website. If you would like to join us tonight, and you don't have a link, please see me after this, uh, after the liturgy is finished, and, uh, and I will get that to you. You're welcome to join us um, seven o'clock every Sunday evening. Also, Wednesdays, we've begun our Episcopal 101 classes, and this is just an exploration of the Episcopal tradition, what makes us unique and special, uh, this coming week, we will be looking at uh, a bit of the history of the Episcopal Church in this country and then looking at our Book of Common Prayer. So that's 7 o'clock on Wednesdays. Lastly, but not least, uh, for your calendars, 10th of October, it's in uh, two weeks' time, is our uh, drive-through blessing of the animals. We did this last year. You are welcome to uh, join us. You can drive through, bike through, or walk through. And the good news is you don't have to have a pet or a best, uh, best beloved um, animal friend to receive a blessing. You can just come through and everyone will be blessed. Let us walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. No. 
you are welcome to stand. We are up the, on page five. And I would ask Desiree if you'd like to come forward and we'll bless, uh, bless the icon. If you have not had an opportunity to look at the incredible new icon we have, Christ, the risen Christ, uh, it is here. Uh, please do come and take a look at it. Uh, we do have a candle stand which is on order which will be uh, next to it so we can uh, make our prayers and, uh, and intentions. So we're on page five and we're going to use a blessing that's adapted from the uh, Greek Archdiocese of America. Lord our God, who created us after your own image and likeness, who loves us in Christ, who took upon himself the form of a servant and became human, who, having taken upon himself our likeness, and through whom also we are transformed into the image of your true blessedness. Your Christ we venerate as being in your image and likeness, and we adore and glorify you as our Creator. Wherefore, we pray, pray you, send forth your blessing upon this icon, and with the sprinkling of hallowed water, bless and make holy this icon unto your glory, in honour of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And grant that blessing will be to all who venerate this icon, and send up their prayer unto you standing before it. Through the grace and bounties and love of your only begotten Son, with whom you are blessed together with your all-holy, good and life-creating Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Hallowed and blessed is this icon of the risen and exalted Christ, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, and through the sprinkling of holy water. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Desiree. And now, may this Holy Eucharist, this Blessed Communion, draw us always closer to our God and nearer God's Blessed Kingdom. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your Proclaim the glory of your name. 
Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take heed, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you with unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Jesus taught us, and as Jesus prays with us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us your peace. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper.
Shall we stand as we're able? Page eight. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look kindly upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and touch all that you love and pray for this day and for all days. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>